Hello and welcome to episode 20 of the Paranormal Paradigm podcast. What a milestone. I can't quite believe I've got to episode 20, to be honest, and it's all down to you guys, the listeners. Um, You're the ones that have made this possible, really, because I do this for you. And, you know, the fact that you guys are out there listening, wanting more, um, keeps me going, really. So thank you very much for that. Um, Today I'm joined by James Brody. Now, um, those guys that listened to the last episode where I had several listeners on to talk through their experiences will remember James as uh, the last guest on that episode who came on and gave us some fascinating experiences, Um, several including, you know, in in the house that he lives in now, um, involving himself and his family and and even one at at, at the the birth of his child, which was was great. So I thought I'd get James back on because he's a local guy to me and uh, a fellow investigator with years of experience, um, years of honing his expertise and the techniques that he uses. I know he's very keen on using specific types of cameras. So I thought it'd be a really good interview if we, if we got James back on and just delved a little bit deeper into his take on paranormal investigating and, you know, the likes and the dislikes of the field, in his opinion. Um, and we'll also be discussing his favourite experiments, his favourite techniques, going into a bit more detail about um, his experiences and also talking about um, a shared um theory that we both have which is what spirit activity might actually be and i'm sure you guys have heard me mention this plenty of times before but it'd be interesting to get uh, a different person's take on it and how they kind of see it in that sense as well so um so yeah it should be good um before we get to the interview though i thought i'd give you guys a chance of um winning a signed copy of my book so i've done this before where i asked for you guys to send in a um, an experience of yours and I, I picked I picked my favorite one and that went to Dan uh, up in Newcastle so here's another chance so this time I'm really looking for again any personal experiences you've had or any evidence that you guys might have it might be a photo it might be a video it might be anything like that um, or just a, a written experience is good as well um, and I'll sift through them and uh, whichever one takes my fancy the most whichever one I think is um, is the best piece of evidence that, that I come across. Will be the lucky winner of a copy of my book, uh, An Introduction to Paranormal Investigation, a signed copy. Um, and yeah, so get those experiences into me, get those photos, those videos into me. They can come to uh, the Facebook group. You can send them by email, paranormalparadigmpodcast at gmail.com. Or you can send them directly to me via my Facebook, uh, Kieran Woodhouse. You can find me easily. Send me a uh, send me a friend request or a, a chat request, and I'll uh, I'll accept no problem. And this is just a, a way of me saying thank you to you guys really for keeping me going to episode twenty. Because um, as I say, I, I do do it for you for you guys, and I'm glad you're enjoying it. The feedback's great. The followers are going up. The listens are going up. We're, we're having listeners all around the world now. You know, um, Honduras, as I've said before, Germany, Spain. Um, hello to all of you thank you for tuning in Um, please do get in in touch if if you'd like a chat or if you've got any feedback on the show or any suggestions I do welcome that Um, so yeah send your stories in and I will pick a lucky winner and for now let's get on with the interview with James and welcome James welcome back mate oh thank you for having me back Um, really been looking forward to this since our last chat Uh, obviously we talk um, outside of this you know we we message each other but um, since our last chat on the previous episode I've really been looking forward to going a bit deeper into into your theories and your um, your experiences your techniques and your thoughts so um, people that listen to the last episode will know a bit about you and they'll know what kind of got you into all of this yep Um, so as you've kind of progressed as an investigator what would you say is your you know, your, your, your favourite piece of, not, not necessarily equipment, but what's your favourite part of an investigation? So I think that my favourite part is when you do the initial handshake. So, um, for for example, um, myself and the, the team I was with at the time were asked to visit a number of um, residential properties. And this is where people believe that they have genuine issues uh, around, their, around their property. And it's getting to meet that person, um, trying to find out a little bit about the, uh, the property, and then really just trying to... Um, help put their minds at 
rest and that's either done through you know a a proper investigation um or it's a case if you're able to easily um disprove something but you do it in a you do it in a way that isn't belittling of the of the person that's brought the the yeah. issue up. You, you work with them and you try you know one, and one of the very first questions you ask them is is what are you looking at what are you looking for us to do at the end of this so I think that's Absolutely. a very, very important, very, very important question because at the end of the day, they're welcoming you into their home, and so you know you want to work with them and make you know help and reassure them. Yeah, I, I get that because you know there are, there are quite often times you meet people on these, particularly on these private investigations, Absolutely. as you say, when you're in their house, yeah. and most of the time they might not want to do a spirit board or yeah. they might have aversions to I don't know recording on EVP and you really Absolutely. have to set the groundwork you know what do you want mm. what don't you want because the last thing you want to do is be upsetting someone in their own home by you know whipping out the, the spirit <laughs> boards and, and, and upsetting what? them well, well that, that's it. I think it's really, really important that you, you, you know, you start off with the absolute basics and you explain what it is you're going to do. Which is often that what what you're looking to do is benchmark the property. So you, uh, you go around, you look for uh, various sort of known issues, so things like power supplies, uh, looking for drafts, that that sort of thing. And I know you said about um, one, one of the favourite things. Why well, you use something called an EDI meter? And I don't know whether you have come across this before, but essentially, it's probably as close as you're going to get to the device they're using Ghostbusters where they detect various things so it's like a, a small essentially it's a small box with some uh, with some flashing lights on it but but what those uh, what those flashing lights do is they give you uh, EMF they give you an ambient uh, thermometer they give you a yeah. geophone motion sensor humidity and pressure now each one of those items in themselves might not be enough to uh, you know to either to, to prove or disprove something but when you're getting consistent uh readings across all five then that kind of helps you to maybe debunk some of the uh you know sort of, sort of the the usual sort of um suspects and will help you to sort of like um help you to move your uh, investigation in the right direction yeah, I, I get that. And sorry for the listeners that can hear an ice cream van in the background. <laughs> it is quite nice here at the moment, and the ice cream man's going around encouraging people just to come out of lockdown yeah. to get a to get a nice little uh, whippy. Um, but yeah, yeah, you're you're absolutely right there. I think sometimes people are quick to jump to the conclusion that something is paranormal. Um, mm-hmm. You know, just a quick drop into temperature. Well, that's paranormal. It could easily be a draft or a breeze. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're right that when you get a culmination of everything kind of being affected all at once, the chances of that happening are, are, are ultra slim. Absolutely. And that's when that's when you kind of have to start asking the questions. And when you mention the the quick brief of the house, that's brilliant. You know, you you want to make sure that when you stood there in the dark and your EMF meters going crazy, you're not just stood below the the fuse box. You know, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> you know, absolutely. You make sure you know where the fuse box is. So when it does start going crazy, you can debunk it straight away. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I, I get that. Um, so is there a part of going to somebody's house or you know any kind of investigation? Mm-hmm. Is there a part that you don't necessarily look forward to? Because I think that is everybody has it you know as much as yeah they, there's always something that you just don't like and what would that be for you well i think that for me i found that when i've gone with uh with, with friends or people I, I i don't know particularly well and we've gone on the sort of larger events because i'm always quite interested to see how some of these more sort of commercial events uh take place and looking at the sort of techniques they they use and one of the big challenges you have is when you ask out to the room you know you've got maybe 20 30 people from different backgrounds you say right what what are you here for and they're saying oh well i want to be scared you know it's a, i hope it'll be a bit like a horror film and yeah. it's a case of straight away you know that that will kill the evening straight away you, you, you know that because what will happen is people will jump at the slightest uh, thing or uh, you know they they will be disruptive and it really sort of destroys the uh, the overall event to the extent that i've stopped going to the commercial events i mean i went to one last year and it was exactly that that you know there was some quite interesting stuff and that was actually in the uh, Durngate theater in northampton which was very interesting wow, yeah. uh, very very interesting building you know got some great readings um which because i asked the uh, the people beforehand say that you obviously know where the hot spots are don't say anything to me just yet let me have a look first and actually we were able to find using uh, things like the edi meter we actually were able to pinpoint three or four places that actually were the hot spots before they even said anything that was great but that was then spoilt by you know uh, you're trying to take readings and people are just shouting at each other and stuff you know and uh and, and it just really brings the whole sort of event down it's great when you get 
like-minded people, but often you don't. <laughs> no, I think again, it's it's kind of like interviewing myself here because that that's exactly you know my opinion on, and and the listeners to this show would have heard me many times um, talk about my opinion on the big franchise groups, yeah. the yeah. big you know the, the entertainment industry as as I've called it now, um, because you're right. As soon as you go, they tell you where the hotspots are because they they're subconsciously telling you. You know, you're going to feel something over there because mm-hmm. um, they need you to feel something to yeah. basically justify the high cost that you've paid well, 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 to, this to go is, on this thing. This is, and you've made a very good point there. It's it's the commercial nature of these events now, which means that a lot of sort of historical sites are now actually locked down that these organisations, I won't name any, but it's a case of I know for a fact there's three or four that have essentially locked down an area uh, because they've paid the owners like a holding fee yeah. and then they get exclusivity to that site. And so the actual areas of, of general interest that should be there for everyone are actually locked locked down or you've got to try and book something you know, months and months in advance. Yeah, I mean, we. It, I, I, I've coined the phrase now. It's, it's becoming an expensive hobby. Um, yeah. You know, you'll, you'll go into these to, to these places. The only way you've got of getting into some of these places is by going with these groups, because you yeah. know, the, either the place won't book you because they're exclusive yeah. to the group, as you say, yeah. or their price is so high, which of course oh, the, exactly. the, these groups can afford because they're charged. They're passing that cost on to the to, to oh, the customer. Um, but you know, the average group like myself and, 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 and yourself we can't afford that no, um no. and you can't afford the insurance alone <laughs> just to be oh, able to, to know, cover it um so th- th- it's effectively pricing um we're not amateurs but we you know it's effectively pricing us out of the game yeah, yeah. I, I, absolutely, and I know, and I think that's one of the ch- things that are changing away from the sort of, uh, you know, the, the more sort of common sites, and it's becoming more personal, where people are reaching out to you through through word of mouth, and I think that's often actually where you find some of the most interesting things, things that you don't, you won't be able to pre-investigate somewhere. It's a case if you turn up and you try and do a a sort of um, well, an assessment of of where you are when you walk through the door, sort of thing. Yeah, I, I, again, I think you're right because you, you go to some of these places and they get so bigged up. You know, I mean, oh, I've been absolutely. to places like the Ancient Ramen. Um, oh, same here, and same here. Yeah, yeah. Well, I went after after uh, John had died, and yeah. I've got to be honest, it was one of the most boring um, nights I've had um, yeah. in terms of paranormal yeah. investigating, and um, I just didn't enjoy it. There was, I, I no. felt, I felt like it was really flat. And, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. There were, there were people with me that had a great night, um, but yeah. personally, I just didn't. I just didn't feel anything. Um, and because you go with that hype, and I think yeah. people go to these places with so much hype that they're almost manifesting their experiences oh. themselves off the back of the hype. Absolutely. And you think, yeah, and you think if you hadn't heard anything, or if you didn't know mm. what this place was all about, would you have, would you have experienced what you've experienced? And, and I doubt that. Um, yeah. So finding these little you know, private investigations, these unique places, mm. places no one's ever done before. Mm. And you're treading on, you know, new ground, fresh ground. And I think it holds a lot more opportunity. Absolutely. No, I totally agree with that. Um, so, so that, so we've really covered there your likes and your dislikes. What, what do you, what's your go-to piece of equipment? Cause I remember when we first met, you were mm. very keen on talking to me about the cameras that you used. Yes. And you didn't like the digital cameras, which really fit right. with what I was talking about on the night, the future of evidence, how to cameras can be tampered with and photos can yeah. be digitalized yeah. and exactly. photoshopped. So do you want to just tell us a bit about the camera you use while you use it? Yes, sure. So in fact, I was just, I was just seeing whether I actually had it here in front of me. Let me just see, cause I can give you the model. So, well, essentially what it is, is it is a older Sony um, sort of uh, camcorder. It's, it's still quite small and, uh, and compact, uh, but it uses the, the mini tapes. And the, the reason for the mini tapes, like you said, is that it is far more difficult for things like light anomalies and, uh, you know, and also that ability to digitally alter because you have that sort of uh, that imperfection of tape. It makes it, it, it sort of adds an extra authenticity to what it is you're recording. The downside is it takes you half a day to actually transfer the, uh, the film from your camera to your, to your PC. Cause a lot of the uh, stuff is, is no longer compatible with with a lot of modern PCs. But uh, I found that, um, you know, this, this, camcorder i've had for uh well probably about 15 15 20 years now and um it was something that that 
had a really good um, night vision uh, sensor to it. And so it was great for picking stuff up in, in literally sort of uh, pitch darkness. And uh, I found that uh, then being able to sort of uh, look at it afterwards, um, you know, it gave it gave you that sort of authenticity that I think you you don't get nowadays through that pure digital uh, format it's you know it's very simple people say to me oh why do you bring something like that with you it was a lot older why i just use my phone and stuff and you say well the thing is is that the way a lot of modern camera sensors uh, work and the processing power behind it means actually you are far more susceptible to lighting um effects you know things like dust and, and stuff yeah. like that whereas if you can pick something up um you know on tape uh, using that older um, sort of night vision camera, then it's far more likely that you've picked something up than rather using a modern uh, phone or, or you know, some of the modern digital cameras. And I think that one of the things that is going to change is that now, um, you know, certainly Samsung having their latest phones, and I think Apple are doing the same, where you've almost got a sort of near dark um lighting yes. conditions yeah, yeah. and i think that the problem is that with the flash that they use there again that interferes with you actually picking up um any anything there i've i've really struggled if when any time i've tried to use a, f- um, a phone and stuff like that and uh, and part of my sort of um background just away from ghost hunting is i actually come from a a software testing sort of background so part of my um sort of uh working practice is to naturally test stuff and i found that uh the sort of the better the technology gets, uh, the less reliable it is. <laughs> Certainly fine for, uh, uh, for 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 our sort of line of work. And I think that really it's better to sort of like stay analog if you if you can and and get that sort of uh, authenticity from the from the film that you just won't get using purely purely digital formats. Well, do you think that the camera that you're using is, is because it really is just made for taking pictures? You know, you've got a phone. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's used for taking selfies. It's used for putting mm. dog faces on, on teenage yeah, girls. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You exactly. know, it's used for so a multitude of things. And um, so it doesn't really focus on doing one thing really, mm. really well. Mm. Um, and and I've, I've often found that if I use a digital camera, I pick up, I pick up a lot less, and I'm using quote marks here, a lot less orbs than I do if I'm using a camera on my mobile phone with a with a yeah. big flash. Because yeah. the second you even turn the camera on without taking a picture, uh, you can see the dust. Oh, abs- <laughs> you know, absolutely! It highlights it, and and that's something you don't see on the type of camera that that, that you're discussing. Um, mm-hmm. Simply because of, of the setup, really. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I, th- I think. Do, do do you find that you? I mean, I'm assuming you've used other cameras over time. Yes. Have you found that you've picked up more evidence using your your classic Sony camera? Yes. Yeah, so I so I um, let's have a look. So a couple of years ago, I got uh, a Nikon sort of digital camera. Um, it, it was it was quite a, a high spec uh, version. So I thought, right, I'll try and take something with that is that is traditionally a camera, but it does take um, high definition video as well. And uh, I find very mixed results from that and, and i still find that if my camcorder picks something up i'm far more likely to believe that that's picked up and i don't know whether it's down to the the particular type of infrared sensor that it used because i know that it got discontinued some time ago uh, through privacy issues and i think that um there's something it, it, there's maybe an aspect of the technology that we won't see again in in more sort of modern devices and so i think it just cut out a lot of the sort of background noise that the more sort of traditional sorry some of the newer um devices have yeah i mean for for, for me the the way we've done in terms of investigating the paranormal all these mod cons all these gadgets that you can use you know people just stick the word ghost equipment on the back and <laughs> it goes up 30 pounds you know Absolutely. um and, and people buy it you know and I, I, do you think that it's had technology has had a negative impact on on the paranormal more than a positive yes because i think that um one of the challenges you, you have is, and this is actually a, a wider problem in society, is what is the value that you uh, assign to a digital item? What is the what is the uh, you know what what is the the, the price that you're attaching or, or the uh, authentic, authenticity that you're attaching to to what you're what you're picking up? And I think that um, we, we find that as things become more digital, they become far more easy to manipulate. I mean, anyone that's familiar with 
software, you know, things like Adobe Illustrator, stuff like that can come up with, especially around UFOs and things like that, will mm-hmm. can really be used to very, very easily um, sort of manipulate images. And uh, and that's and that's a real shame because now it means that because you're aware that, uh, that you know, how, th- how things are done, that it means that what you're picking up now is far more unbelievable. And so that even if you do genuinely pick stuff up, there are people there that straight away go, oh, that's Photoshop, that is, and will immediately debunk anything that you're uh that you're including there and um and that is a real that is a real challenge to what to what we're doing i think that one area that um is definitely an improvement though is around thermal imaging because the cost of thermal imaging is is coming down and now you can get a, a sort of a, a you know a, a basic thermal imaging add-on for your for your iphone for a, for a couple hundred pounds and that's something i may look to invest uh, invest in at a later date and i think that being able to give you that ability to look at things with a with through a different spectral range i think that is certainly something that's going to be very helpful. But the minute those that sort of technology is prohibitive to most of us, and uh, I think that when that becomes more um, within general people's grasp, then I think that will help us to uh, pick things up, especially around um, you know you know the differences between you know your cold and your warm areas, and, and a lot of the time you know you can pick something on there like people walking past stuff like that, um, which. I think is a real, which will be a, a real sort of growth area for us. But at the minute, it's it's still prohibitive, the cost uh, cost wise. Yeah, I, I think the thermal imaging you've just touched on there. The thermal imaging camera is one of my favourite pieces of equipment. We've we've got some really great pieces of evidence with that. Um, a chair that no one sat in it is red hot, yeah. as if somebody's you know sat on it. Mm. Um, and and as you say, it allows you to see. And we'll move on to to our theories yeah. in, in yeah. a little while. But it allows you to see into another spectrum of of, of the light field um, mm. that the human eye can't see infrared. Um, and of course, there's other pieces of equipment like the ultraviolet torches and stuff, which yeah. allow us to see into that field as well. Mm. Um, and you, you briefly touched there on the cost of things. And again, you're absolutely right. These big groups that are bringing in a lot of money can afford these high end oh, pieces absolutely. of equipment. You know, the the average Joe blogs like myself and, and yourself, we we can't really afford three, four hundred no. pound for for for, a, for an infrared camera um, yeah. or for a thermal imaging camera. Mm. Um, so we we are really just waiting for that price to drop so we can get our hands on it because um, yes. it does limit us. So you you talk about um, the, the 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 camera and, and that kind of mm. technology, um, but do you do you think that um, other kind of gadgets, all the gadgets that we use, we use the K2s, mm. you know, we use yes. the EVP recorders, we use yes. the, um, the the thermal imaging, we use the mm. stuff that measures the, um, I guess the, wow, well, what's the word, the kind of the temperature and the, yep. Yep. Uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. Do you think that that is worth it? Do, do you think sometimes it, it's worth better to just sit in a room on your own, no piece of equipment? Yeah. and really feel what you experience. Uh, well, I think you've made a really, really key point there. And I think that technology, if you're not careful, um, sort of spoils the whole experience and you are trying to rely on it to generate something rather than actually using yourself as the center to, uh, you know, to, to interact or interface with whatever energy is going on in a particular building. And I think that the most important thing you should be doing is, is um, I think that you need to go and do that benchmark start and on any property that you're that you're going to to visit then you you've got to do this sort of checking for the mf fields and stuff like that because um and i'll i'll only go into this um just just a little bit is people might not be aware that um with emf fields it's been proven that um that EMF can actually generate uh, different uh, emotions in in people. There was actually a BBC Two documentary a few years ago where they uh, essentially brought in this uh, female presenter and they put what looked like a colander on a head with a load of diodes and stuff on it. You know, very very sort of uh, Ghostbusters sort of. Uh, <laughs> thing. But, what they, but what they did was they actually generated a number of uh, different electrical fields around her. So, for example, um, they made a field that there was somebody standing behind them. Uh, they made her feel that there's something evil in the room uh, the the most interesting one was the one where they actually made her feel that she was floating and she was literally holding on to the chair because she genuinely thought that she was being lifted off from the chair and this was all about the electrical field that um was being generated uh, by her and uh, and again and we'll, we'll talk in theory in, in a little bit but it's very much about every living thing gives off an electromagnetic field it's how sharks uh, you know uh, a number of different animals 
animals um, hunt. They're able to pick up on different uh, uh, di- different sort of ma- uh, electromagnetic fields off off uh, off living off living um, uh, sort of um, animals. And uh, and I think that um, you have to do that. You have to do that benchmarking. You have to um, make sure that you gauge how a room is. But then once you've done all that, that's when I think you need to put the technology down and just say right what am i actually picking what is my general feeling using your own intuition and i think the challenge with that is is that you know through your own investigation you know what to look for and if people are unfamiliar with that they might be thinking well what are you doing why are you just sitting uh in in the middle of the room what what is that (laughs) trying to do and i think that what technology will allow you to do will allow you to potentially share information share an experience from a uh, from a data perspective but it doesn't share the the personal experience, and that's the key. That's the key thing that we should remember. At the end of the day, this is a personal experience. Even when you're in a group, it is still a personal experience. And and again, this is something that, that you talk a lot about. Is is that you know one person can be standing next to another person. Someone might be picking up something amazing, whereas the other person just thinks it's a dead room. Yeah, I, 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 you know, obviously, I couldn't agree more because, as you say, this is something I talk about a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. And 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 I think that. The, the, the just sitting there and, and moving all the gadgets away from yourself. and Because, you know, gadgets can be faulty. You can have a faulty yes. battery. You can have a faulty piece of equipment that's giving you false readings. Can you really trust it? Probably not. You yeah. can always trust yourself. And if, yes. you, you know, if you're telling yourself or you're telling someone you've seen something and you're lying, well, that's your, that's your fault and you've got to go and, you know, you've got to yeah. go to bed that night knowing you've lied. Yeah. If you've experienced it personally, yeah. no one can take that away from you. And well, that, I think ultimately that's what it's all about. Yeah, and I, it's about, and I think the other thing is, is uh, it's about the provenance. So it's the provenance as you as an investigator. So what do you bring? Uh, you know, what is it that you know that the person off the street doesn't know? What's the experience that you can bring, and what's the insights that you can bring? Uh, and then really, the uh, the gadgets should be the secondary data which helps support your initial thoughts. I think you've made a fantastic point there because anyone. Anyone experienced or not can walk into a room with a K2 and yes. it, it will go off. You know, anyone yeah. can do that. It's really about the experience and it's really about, you know, when you've been to numerous locations mm. and, and there's many investigations that I'm sure you have as, as well as I, yeah. you, you, you learn stuff, you learn techniques oh, that, that doesn't involve equipment and yes. you learn how you learn how to be, I don't know, it sounds silly, but there is a specific way to sit quiet in a room and listen because yes. you have to, you know, it's not just sitting there. You have to understand that that noise that goes off every 10 seconds is the boiler. Yep. And yes. that flash that you see every now and then is an emergency light. And you have to tune all of that in and then tune it out. So you're yes. not taking that in. So you can understand the noises, the external noises that might be paranormal. So that's a fantastic point you've made there. Um, okay. So just moving on, uh, sticking with the kind of investigation side before we move on to the mm. theories. Um out of all the places you've been, you know, you've been yes. on these these, these yep. hunts with the big groups, the franchises, yes. yep. where would you say is your favourite location you've ever you've ever? Yeah, so for, for pure location, because the overall experience was very mixed, but just as a, an out-and-out location, it will be uh, the uh, Kelvdon Hatch um, nuclear bunker in Essex. Now, it's, it, it's very funny in that it's marked as this secret nuclear bunker, although there are signposts about 20 <laughs> miles away. To, <laughs> but what's, what's great about this is, is that you, it's, in the, it's sort of um, out in the woods, and literally at the top is just a cottage. It is a small sort of house surrounded by uh by sort of woods and a couple of outhouses but then you go literally through um through the building and downstairs and it is this huge nuclear bunker that is that was built uh i think it was built uh let's see if i remember 1952 is where it was built and it was decommissioned in 1992 but what they've done is they've kept a lot of the uh the kept a lot of the rooms uh, as there were a lot of the technology that was there and it, it's it's really sort of quite a quite an eerie experience that this was a place that they would put 600 people in 
uh, that would literally look to live out uh, a a nuclear holocaust. <laughs> so wow. uh, not particularly not not particularly cheery, but uh, but it's a case of as a pure sort of insight into um, into humanity as to how people were thinking at the time, uh, a real sort of uh, living museum piece. Then I think that that building is absolutely amazing. And again, what's great is you've not only have you then got the downstairs, but you've then also got some huge tunnels there as well, which is absolutely fantastic. And one of the great things about it is the silence you get there because it's underground. Um, yeah. It's very, very quiet. So if you do hear a noise, then it's uh, it, it's far more difficult to immediately sort of discount it as, uh, you know, things like floorboards creak, creaking and stuff like that, because it is essentially a sort of silent building. Well, I mean, it reminds me a lot of dry clo tunnels. I don't know if you've ever... If you've ever investigated there, that's one of the places that's slowly going over to the dark side in terms of being (laughs) franchise only. Uh, But we we used to do that regularly, like once every couple of months. I mean, it's five Mm. miles worth of tunnels. It was a it was it was going to be used as a as a Cold War nuclear bunker. Um, I mean, some of these tunnels that you can get like Arctic lorries down side by side. They're they're absolutely ginormous. How big was this place in in Essex? Um, Ah. it's difficult to put a size on it because I mean it was a case if you looked at it from the from the outside just seeing this small sort of cottage you yeah. wouldn't believe that there was this huge sort of underground complex it was massive it was absolutely massive and it had big big tunnels and I guess the the only other place a little bit close to the home which was a, a, a real sort of surprise was uh, would you believe Smethwick swimming baths uh, so that is my absolute favourite place to investigate you know <laughs> it, it is it's how, I've had how, some experiences how, there. How unexpected is it there? I mean, you, you just don't expect yeah. it, do you? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I often say because of that, because of that very place, you know, if somewhere looked haunted, it's probably not. I mean, when yeah. we went, there were still children coming out with their parents <laughs> with their armbands <laughs> on and stuff, you know. Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. When we went to set up and then we gave it an hour or so as, as for the building to relax and yeah. all the pipes to kind of calm down. And I tell you, some of the experiences I oh, no. personally I had there. <laughs> I mean, just let's talk about that. What 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 was it you experienced there? What was it that made it one of your favourite places? Um, so I think it, it was a fact that going there and not expecting a lot out of a public building. And like you said, once it calms down, you would find that there, there were some rooms that um, – well, just just you would go in there and you would immediately feel a change in the atmosphere. I mean, I mean, yeah. quite I mean, quite noticeable. You would literally you would walk into a room and you would swear blind that somebody's squeezing your head, you know, uh, and it, it would be quite a sort of strong sort of um, feeling that you'd, you'd go in there. And uh, again, for people that weren't particularly experienced, it actually really unnerved a lot of people. I don't, I don't know whether you found that. So you, you'd go into somewhere and you would get this, not necessarily, I wouldn't even necessarily say it was a hostile sort of uh, environment, but it was definitely, you walk in and you go, right, okay, so somebody's making themselves known pretty quickly. <laughs> Where, whereabouts was that? Because I've, um, I've got two locations there that, that that's maybe free, but two that stand out personally to me. And one was there's a corridor that runs down into a boiler room. Yeah, yeah, the boiler room. That's the only way in and out of the boiler room. Yeah. And then yeah. there was the cellar aspect of it. You know, you go down in the cellars and you've got the big pipes running along the wall and you can barely fit in it. Um, for me, those two were the locations. Well, well yeah, because the thing is as well, when you're going into things like the cellar, uh, then you're fighting your sort of, your primeval urge to not go into a dark, confined place. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's and that's what really freaks people out, because it is, it is very primeval. You know, the reason why you get that feeling is because it was your defence mechanism. When, you, when we used to live in caves, about look out for the, the bear in the cave or look out for yeah, the snake in yeah. the cave, you know, you're, yeah. you are looking out uh, for that. And uh, I think that the 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 pipes it's quite interesting you brought them up because i found they really messed with people because obviously with pipes you expect a certain amount of ambient noise yeah from there but sometimes it could be quite active as well and it wouldn't be like a uh it wouldn't be like a, a tapping every now and again you'd get an almighty clang from it and you, you know and, and when you're not expecting it you see people jump about 10 foot from the air yeah well, i think the thing is because it's still an operating function of swimming baths uh, they're still kind of putting the chlorine into the pool once it's closed and you yeah. know they're, they're cleaning it out kind of and, and i think that's the noises that you could hear that's why yeah. we we when we went down there it was kind of like the last place we did yeah because it was later in the night and it gave it all the pipes really time to calm down i mean that corridor we had a guest that was with us that contacted their dad on a spirit board i don't know if i've ever told oh, really told no, us, no 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 not at all um we, we, we there were three of us it was me another crew member and uh, a guest i, I can't remember mm. the name of the guest but we were doing these 
these um the, the these questions and out of nowhere he said i think i'm talking to my dad and we were doing it on a windowsill in the corridor oh wow and there, was, there was only us three there yeah. and um he said i think it's my dad so immediately i said well you take your hand off the glass um yeah. and, and it was just me and les that carried on yeah. Because yeah. even if he's not knowing he's moving it subconsciously, yeah. it could be. So I, w- yeah. I wanted to re- remove that possibility. Yeah. And we continued to ask questions. And um, he then started asking personal questions. What's the name of my eldest son? Mm-hmm. What street did I grow up on? Mm-hmm. Uh, what's my mom's name? All this stuff. And he asked about nine questions or so. And every yeah. single one, me and Les got right. Oh, um, wow. And he wasn't touching the glass. He left in tears. We had to c- kind of you know, yeah. get out of there, calm him down with a cup of tea. Um, yeah. and, um, he couldn't believe it. And, and for me, if you, if you're not talking about spirit activity there, then you mm. must be talking about some kind of telekinesis where exactly. he was putting the answers into mine and Les's head, because yeah. I can't think of any other way we, you know, I didn't know this guy from Adam, Les didn't know yeah. him, but we answered every single one of these questions. Right. And I can't explain that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's great. And when you get that sort of experience, uh, you know, that that those are the ones that you remember. The real sort of things you go, well, how on earth did that happen? I, I really can't explain what happened there. And I think that um, when you get something that's got a certain amount of certainty to it, it kind of removes a little bit of your sort of natural doubt that's in there. Because I think that certainly, you know, I started ghost hunting because of various things that I'd, I'd seen. And, I, you know, part of me wanted to, to check, right, Am I going mad, or uh, yeah. is there is there actually something more to this? And and over the years, then yes, you know, experience a great great sort of um, sort of collection of, of different experiences, which make me feel you know. And I think that a lot of it, like I said, is going back to that that personal experience. But I think that from my personal experience, I think I've seen enough there to make me think that yes, there is something else there. So what what was it at, before we move on? What was it at? the swimming baths what did, did you experience anything personally there um so really with with me it was a case of i i felt that i was quite aggressively latched onto when, okay. when i was when i was there so when i when i went in um now then let's let's have a look so my because this is a few years ago so this is just before you got to the the cellar so actually before you enter the 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 cellar itself uh the sort of and um the walkway through to it it's a case of that's where suddenly it was right okay so it's it's near dark i've got my ca- i've got my infrared camera uh walking slowly and it just genuinely feels that there is that that there is a great deal of pressure on my head uh, i could literally feel somebody standing to my right shoulder and it followed me uh, and, and that whole time I was there for about half an hour, um, I felt this person right behind me. I asked out. Uh, we had some other we had some other people there that that tried to interact. And what was quite interesting is normally they don't need any excuse to uh, say, "Oh yes, something there." They got nothing, absolutely dead. Uh, they said, "Oh, this is supposed to be one of the most active uh, areas," and it was dead. And it wasn't. And it was purely focused on my, uh, on myself. And it was one of those. Mo- it was one of those moments where you think, "Oh, have I have I misjudged this? Maybe is this? You know, what what's happening here? Is there something that that, that I'm generating that, um, you know, that maybe is clouding my my judgment?" But it wasn't. It was a very very unique not quite unpleasant but certainly not the most uh, you, know, you know not the most pleasant experience i've had but it was focused around my myself in a quite an experienced group and uh, and it was just trying to really understand what it was that was trying to reach out why it had chosen myself at that time and it, it's this day it's still one of those mysteries because we didn't find out more about what it was but it was very much a definite right i'm going to stand by you i'm going to follow you and you are going to know that i'm I'm here standing next to you. Well, and, and that is when, you know, not that can't be captured with a piece of equipment. No, you know, that, no. that is when we talk about it being a personal thing. Yes, that, that, absolutely. That's a classic example, really. Uh, it is, because that cellar, like you said, is an absolute hotspot and nobody got anything else from that from that room. It was wow. really, it was really bizarre. But I was there, and you know, it, as in, it was, it was enough pressure to to put a good sweat on as I <laughs> when I when I came out. Of there. <laughs> um, okay, so that, that that's great. Let Let's move on. I'm keen to to move on to yes. to, to the to the theories. Now, you mentioned yes. to me before we before we started recording that yeah. you you did a, a, a quick bit of research because you wanted yeah. to find a clear and concise way of, of yes. putting over your theory, and that's something I've struggled with because yes. it's kind of like. 
um, in your head. You, you know what you want to say, but you know mm. that when you tell someone, they're going to just look at you like you're talking a foreign language. Um, so I know that we both share the same belief yes. in theories, and I am eager to know <laughs> how you explain it. Sure, so, sure. Shoot. Okay, so, great. So one of the main challenges we have is that scientists will say that uh, it's a case of there's no such things as ghosts because uh, you know physics shows that um, you know, the, there isn't that sort of energy around for us to be able to, to generate it. And I think that it was Nikola Tesla who said that if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency and vibration now that's something that was you know you know 100 plus years ago um but in in modern uh, physics there's something called superstring theory and uh, according to string theory you've got every particle in the universe even at its most microscopic level consists of varying combinations of vibrating strings or strands and each of these strands have a sort of preferred pattern of vibration and what string theory does is it claims that there are very specific um, patterns to strings that then create particles of unique mass and force. And so things like uh, electrons, protons, quarks are all going at different frequencies. And that's the that's the underlying principle, first of all, is that science shows and string theory is sort of uh, is a modern sort of theory that is is seen as the sort of the overarching theory that can that can explain things is that essentially at a fundamental level, the most basic building blocks of the universe are at a, a vibrational level. Now, a branch of uh, superstring theories is, is that there are also uh, 10 dimensions. So, for example, we know that the third dimension is, you know, you've got your up, your down, and you've got your depth, and that your fourth dimension is uh, around time. But as you go through the, uh, the various sort of dimensions, the interesting things are is that uh, when you get to the um, fifth and sixth dimensions, then what you're doing is you're, you are able to see that there are other universes outside of our universe, which will have slight differences to them. Uh, those differences are um, could be that they started at different points in time. There are there are different levels of uh, physics within these universes. Um, and as you go through, until you get through to the sort of uh, ninth dimension, which is where you can compare possible universe histories uh, that have different laws of physics and this is a really key point is that with universes they have they have different histories and that you're able to interact with those uh, with those histories and those points so that i personally don't necessarily think there is such a thing as a ghost what okay. i think that what i think there is is that there is an ability dependent on a person's ability to uh, interact with different vibrations and different frequencies to actually to be able to interact with those different versions of the uh, of the universe and so for example in our world you might see somebody and it looks as if they've walked through a wall but they haven't because basically in their sort of uh, universe there was a door in front of them and so essentially what we're saying is is that there are multiple versions of ourself that operate across uh, different versions of the universe. And in fact, when you get to the 10th uh, dimension, and the reason why there aren't any more than 10 dimensions is because in the 10th dimension, everything is possible and everything is imaginable. Now, I know this sounds a bit made up, but this is actual current physics. This is This is actual string theory that says that we have a number of vibrations, a number of frequencies that um, that exist. They make up the fundamental building blocks of the universe. There are different versions of our of ourself, and so one of the possibilities I think about is that uh, actually, when we look at different vibrations, are we able to connect with different versions of ourself across the various planes? Because again, when I was talking about different universes, the fact that you look at the fifth and sixth dimension is a case if you are able to, the fifth dimension is you're able to see multiple universes. You get to the sixth dimension, you're able to actually interact with those multiple universes. And so I think that if we are to believe that that theory about about string theory about the multiple universes then i find it very strange that you know people like brian cox and that will say oh you know with some certainty he will say that uh, well they can't they can't exist well actually from your basic building blocks your fundamental theory about physics says that actually all things are possible 
and you know and this, this is a this is a real key point so for me i personally think that there is a interaction with different fre- with different frequencies and what they will allow you to do is to be able to see through those um those sort of lines between different realities and you have that in- you have that interaction and i think that what you can do is because one of the, one of the words i used earlier was was history i think that as we know from our experience that sometimes you will get a interaction with 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 someone but sometimes you will always you you will also get a um, replay of an event, a history, yep. and so again, I think that using frequency or vibration, it could be a mixture of of both. Is that, and again, this is this is literally only um, you know to, this this is only touching the tip of the tip of this. Is that I believe that through frequency and vibration, you are able to vibrate, you're able to interact with uh, a different plane of existence that currently. Currently, we don't have the ability to sort of prove that, but through things like the Hadron Collider and stuff, and looking at some of the the particles that have to be generated that underpin this theory, it would certainly suggest that there are multiple versions of the universe. You look at things like gravity. Gravity. One of the big things that concerns people is is that uh, we don't feel in our universe that gravity actually um, fully affects our universe. That, that that there is part of gravity that is missing that only makes sense if you build into the model that there are actually other uh, other universe uh, other universes. And so I, I you know my personal thoughts are is that there are multiple universes out there that we all operate at different frequencies. I think it's the ability to be able to tap into that frequency that oscillation. Um, and uh, that's what allows us to to interact. And I think that you know these are the the building blocks of the uh, of the universe. This is this is current physics that's out there. You can look at this yourself. So I'm not a madman. I'm not making this stuff up. Um, but obviously, I'm only explaining it in very sort of lay terms. There are people there that will say, James, you know, you you need to give it a bit more detail than that. But that fundamental block is is that science fully facilitates the fact that there are vibrations, that there are oscillations, and that these are what generate matter. And so, again, one of the great questions is what happens to us after after death? And it's the tra- transference of matter. Again, this all, full, full, sorry, this all falls into superstring theory in the fact that matter at its most basic level is generated by different frequencies. Okay. Take a breath there, James. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um Okay, I mean, so I was going to touch on a few of the things you, you said. I made a few notes. So yeah. uh, just from the last thing you said there, absolutely agree, because at the end of the day, we are all just energy vibrating to a particular frequency. And yes. if you alter alter that vibration, if you alter that energy, then you can change the shape of something. You can change. Yes. And, and the, the I can never remember the name of it, but the best example is where they put sand on a table. They vibrate it to a particular frequency and it forms a yeah. beautiful symmetrical pattern. They change yeah. the frequency and it moves to another pattern. Um, yeah. cy- cymatics, is that right? I don't yeah, I, th- I, think, I think that's right, yeah. Correct me on that. Um, also, you mentioned about the, um, the, the when we can almost interact with ourselves, our yes. alternate versions of ourselves. We've conducted an experiment with that. And what oh, we okay. did was we we've conducted a spirit board session in a place that we, we investigate regularly mm. and knowing that we will be back there in a year. And mm. um, what we've done is we've asked, um, we've answered questions. Um, uh-huh. So we haven't asked questions. We've, we had questions written down and we spelt out the answers to these questions. They were very random questions, not yeah. the generic questions that you would ask on yeah. a normal spirit board. But what we did is we did it backwards. So we answered questions and what we plan on doing is going back in a year mm. and on the same day, I don't know if that makes a difference or not, we'll see, yep. and yep. we're going to ask the questions that will require those answers. Mm. What we want to see is if potentially what we're getting is this, as you've, as you've touched on there, is this crossover in timelines. Mm. And what we're actually going to do is talk to ourselves. Yes, uh, because you wouldn't get these answers. That, you know, these questions are really weird. And if we get the answers, because we've even spelt some of them wrong, yeah, and we get them spelt the same way, the same answers to the questions, that would be mind blowing. Is it going to work? Well, Probably not. But this is the kind of thought process that me and you have. Absolutely. Um, to develop the field. 
Yeah, and I think that's a fantastic experiment. That is, that is, that's absolutely brilliant. Because what you're essentially doing is you're reverse engineering the the experience. Yeah. Is, is what you're doing, and I think I think that's absolutely superb. And I would genuinely be very very interested to to find out uh, how that goes for you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> as soon as we have a result, whether it be uh, good or bad, I'll, I'll make yeah. sure I, I tell everyone. But uh, I mean, it, 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 you're right because for me, investigating, going back to the start of this of this chat. Mm investigating has really gone stale and we've yes. really plateaued and we're just cruising along everyone uses the same piece of equipment because that's what yvette fielding uses on telly they don't really know why they're using it um, yeah. and we're just not progressing as a field um no. and you know and, and and i think we're not asking the questions everyone always asks the same question are you a man or a woman how old mm-hmm. are you do you mean uh, these aren't the questions we need to be asking we need to be asking is there a god we need yes. to be asking, where are you? How are you existing? You know, we need to be asking those questions. We need to be pushing the boundaries in terms of experiments and in, and techniques. And what you've mentioned there in in your you know your your uh, and it was a brief monologue in terms of the actual <laughs> yes. subject. But what you've mentioned there is 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 really the 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 basis and the foundations of something that we can go forwards and start investigating it from from a different perspective. Uh, absolutely absolutely and i think there's just uh and again you you talked very briefly about you know how people uh, exist those different planes of existence i think the other thing we have to be very careful about as well is the fact that and this is this is really the dark side of the investigation is is that you have the the pure sort of science approach which is what we're looking at but then there are people that will then look at the more sort of occult sort of area of things and and looking at whether people believe in uh, in magic and whether you believe in very sort of uh, you know and i hate the term of angels demons and stuff like that because yeah. a lot of this is down to personal interpretation but yeah. it, it's a case of does i think one of the great questions that's got to be asked is uh, does that have a place in investigation for me personally is a case if you're looking at no you, you you should be looking at science you're trying to be as objective as possible rather than being subjective but the question is is there a situation where um you know talking in you know, you know use, using sort of terminology and uh, and artifacts and stuff like that does that have a, a place in investigation or if you suddenly go into that area does it really kind of just poo poo everything that you're then doing because people go oh well you, you must be you must be in case if you're talking about that sort of thing so i think it, it's it's again it's a part of investigation that i would be interested to find out other people's experiences personally i would still much rather deal with uh, with the science of it and uh, again i pre- appreciate i did sort of monologue there a bit about uh but what, I, <laughs> but what, I, tra- what I was trying to do was give a scientific background a framework that when you talk about this, people say, our oh, science have proven that this doesn't exist. I said, no, no, if anything, I prove that I, I would actually turn that around and say it's, it's proven that it does exist. It does, yeah. It's a fact, the fact that we do have this vibration, the fact that the, the fact that you're even using that terminology says that there is a whole branch of, of science that we are yet to discover. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, uh, uh, again, I'm, I'm making loads of notes here. I'm, uh, Really, what you've just said there about the is, is there a place for the occult or the, the darker yes. side of it? Yes. Um, two points there for, for me. Um, yeah. And I'm going to go a bit David Lynch here. Um, no, go ahead. If you're aware of David Lynch. Yeah, no, I um, know David Lynch. But I mean, one of one of my favourite quotes of his, and I, I'm ad-libbing a little bit, yeah. is that, that there has to be dark in order to illuminate the light. Yes. Because without the darkness in the world, and it's the very yin and yang kind of, yeah. you know, Ex- yeah. uh, experience that if the, if if you don't have dark how do you know what light is oh, you totally know, and, and you need the light to illuminate the dark so for me there are negative frequencies out negative forces negative energies entities mm-hmm. um but also i think that it, it is very again we're back to that word personal and i believe that once you strip away this holographic universe that, that we're mm. in you know these frequencies mm. uh, um once you get down to the coding of the, of the matrix shall we say um i believe that any kind of paranormal phenomena is the same coding but what we're doing is we're manifesting our own beliefs and our own kind of life experiences Absolutely. and our own wants and needs mm. onto this piece of coding and therefore we're seeing what we want so if you're religious you always see the virgin mary yeah. and if you want to go and see bigfoot you will always see bigfoot um and if you want to um attract a darker energy i believe you will 
because yeah. it's the law of attraction. What you put out is what the universe gives back. And I think it's the same. If you really want to, to, to attract a darker energy or a darker entity, mm. I think you will. Uh, yes. And I, I think, yeah. so it's not that does it have a place. Uh, I just think it's there. And, 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 and I think if you want it, you'll get it. Should people be doing it on paranormal investigations? No, yeah, because we're I just agree. looking for evidence. And that yeah. might mean that we do come across it, whether we want to or not. But you know, it, it's it it it's found us. At least we can say we haven't gone purposefully looking for it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we can hold our head on and say, "Look, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're not Sabrina the Teenage Witch or <laughs> or whatever." Um, I mean, interestingly, slightly off topic, it, there are so many programs and films we talk about conditioning of of of, of people through TV and the media yep. and stuff. Uh, there are so many programs now out that are based around satanic worship. Yes. And the darker side of, of, of paranormal and the occult. I mean, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, I used to watch that when I was younger. And it was, yep. um, I can't remember her name, Melissa Joan Hart. And it was yep. very light and very friendly. And, and you watch the new one on Netflix and it's yes. dark and it's very <laughs> gruesome. And and that's just normal now. You know, yeah. you watch that and you think, you, you watch like, I don't know, the devil cutting someone's head off. And you think, yep. yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's yeah. just as normal as you're now watching Coronation Street on a Friday night. <laughs> it is. It, it, it is. It's, and, and it's been because we've been desensitised to it. And, and yeah. so you look at the early sort of 60s horror films and you look at them now and you go, oh, well, that's just rubbish, that is. Yeah. Um, uh, but I, I know certainly a, a great example of this is, so I was watching Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, love, love, the, love the film. I'm a big geek yeah. anyway. And my daughter watched it uh, for the first time. Now, she's, she's 12. And there's one bit in uh, Guardians of the Galaxy when... Uh, the uh, the collector's assistant goes to pick up the affinity uh, stone and it destroys her basically and blows up the whole thing and that really freaked my daughter out because that she had never seen anything like that before whereas it's a case of you know we'd seen stuff like that and so the bits that i thought maybe would freak her out didn't but something like that did That's but now of course yeah. but of course now that you've seen something like that then she's now not scared of anything like because you yeah, it's just normal because you've ex- you've explained it, and so uh, you know. And I think that it's it's quite interesting about. Um, and again, I pr- appreciate this is off topic for a second, but uh, one of the great challenges I have today is that soaps were originally created so that uh, people that that uh, lived in soaps they sort of uh, always had a harder life than you. So the idea being that no matter how bad things you are going through yourself, there are always people in a worse situation than yourself now the point i'm making here is is that what they did was they created these fantastical stories but the way nate the way sort of the media has changed is now suddenly what was fantastical 20 years ago is now the norm that we see today and so people are a lot less shockable um but you would also go and say that you know are there are there different agendas there because again there are a number of things there that are now prevalent in society that uh weren't there 20 years ago but we now sort of accept them as the norm and you know things like the, the, the you know the paranormal and especially over the last uh six months around ufos there's suddenly been a massive sort of uh spike in in their sort of uh, visibility in the in the media so i find that all very interesting as well yeah i think again absolutely right it's the it's the conditioning you know you see um you know and i think that's why we don't really care when when people die because yeah <laughs> because we've true. seen it happen so often yeah. on on, yeah. on films and on, on tv shows and stuff and, mm. and 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 it does kind of condition us and desensitize us and and, mm. and i think you're absolutely right i mean the whole ufo field at the moment is is mind-blowing because they're cut they're kind of there's basically disclosure is going on right now, but everyone's too worried about, you know, should they be going outside or not? And what have the yeah. government actually told them? Yeah. No one's yeah. actually paying any attention. To, and it's all kind of getting lost amongst the, the coronavirus well, issue. Well, at the moment. Well, it is. It's insane. When you think that the U S Navy has actually said, uh, the, you know, this footage is of a UFO. We don't know what it is. I mean, that yeah. is is, yeah. is mind blowing, and yet yeah. that isn't front page. No, it's not front page. And you have to wonder: is is that done on purpose? Yeah. That, that, you know, that they're actually telling us, look, UFOs are real. Uh, mm. No one's paying any attention, but you know mm-hmm. that they're saying, well, we did tell you. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. it's it's again, it, it's mind blowing, that is, and, and you yeah. do have to question the, the timing of it all. Yeah. Um, I think that's a, a great place to start winding it down, actually, James. Absolutely. Um, I mean, so the. The listeners, I mean, is there anywhere they can reach you? Because you, you, this theory that you spoke of, it, it's fascinating, it's brilliant, I agree with it, uh, and we'll talk more about this kind of off-air. Um, yeah. But 
is there any any way that listeners can get in touch with you should they want to kind of um, elaborate a bit more yeah, so I, I think, well, I'm literally just putting together um, my old website again. But I think that what I would what I would suggest is, is that if people want to uh, uh, reach out to me, then if they use um, the, the, f- the following email address, which is uh, Mobius, M-O-B-I-O-U-S at live dot co dot uk as a starting point if people want to reach out to me there and i'm more than happy to uh, listen to uh, people's uh, theories and, and again you know to get feedback as to, as to whether they think uh, i've come up with something or or whether uh, i'm talking rubbish i don't mind i'm quite happy to see <laughs> uh, quite as any good scientist i'm quite happy to, to be challenged yeah well you say that but most scientists aren't if you challenge them <laughs> they kind of hide behind yeah. you know you, you can't challenge yeah. that that's right yeah. um okay so they can catch you uh, that's m-o-b-i-o-u-s was that that's right yeah. at live.co.uk yeah that's it okay brilliant uh, and and really the last word is always over to the guests so anything you want to kind of say before we before we leave well, no, just to say to keep a to keep an open mind and uh you know and and to remember that a lot of those experiences are deeply personal so don't be put off if you've had something that you found personal to you to yourself that um you know don't be ready just to throw that away it's it's something that's personal to you and maybe you can find out a bit more about what's happened brilliant Thank you very much, James. Thank you for coming on. I'll be sure to get you on. Once you've developed your theory a little bit more, um, we'll we'll get you back on and uh, we'll go a little bit deeper. Okay, then. Thanks a lot, then. Brilliant. Take care. Bye. So that was the interview there with James Brody. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I absolutely thoroughly enjoyed it. It's always great to talk to um, fellow investigators and get their take on, on the paranormal investigative field and their opinions on certain things. And, um, you know, it's even better when you, you kind of share the same theories and the same thoughts um, because, you know, it just makes chatting with them so much easier as, as a host. Um, so, I mean, he mentioned some absolutely brilliant points there. He's, um, I did joke with him about the monologue that he gave um, with his theories, but it was, again, it was absolutely fine. I, I, I enjoyed it. Um, I did make some lots of notes um, and um, kind of tried to make head and tail of it and I'll go away and dissect it and, probably end up talking to him about it again just asking him a few questions and as, as i said if you guys have got any questions to ask of him regarding his theory and his thoughts uh he can be reached at mobius at live.co.uk it's m-o-b-i-o-u-s at live.co.uk i'll make sure to put that in the description of the um of the show uh, and do just ask him you know he's a friendly chap he, he'll answer any questions that you've got and have a chat with you because um, it was an interesting theory. It's very, very closely linked to mine. I think he words certain things differently to me. Um, uh, certain things he might phrase a bit differently, but I think ultimately we're kind of coming at it the same way and, and, and we both mean the same thing. Um, so it's an absolutely brilliant, um, a brilliant interview. And, you know, I, I'm sure that at some point myself and James are going to collaborate and, and investigate together. There's early, early days um, talking at the moment about getting together and just filming a few investigations for YouTube. So keep your eyes peeled for that. That should be good. Um, so, yeah, um, hope you enjoyed that. And do remember what I mentioned in the introduction. Uh, you guys can uh, win a signed copy of my book. All you need to do is send me um, a written um, experience that you've had, paranormal. It doesn't have to be ghosts. It can be anything, UFOs or anything like that. Um, send me a written uh, description of what it was you experienced. And uh, if you've got evidence, if you've got photos, if you've got a video, if you've got audio footage of, of a, a disembodied voice talking to you, send that across to me. I'd love to see it. And I'll pick my favourite. And whoever wins, I'll announce on the next show and contact them and I'll post out a signed copy of my book. Obviously, with what's going on at the moment around the world, do expect a delay in the posting of that book. Um, And you can send all of your evidence and your um, stories to paranormalparadigmpodcast at gmail.com. You can reach me through Facebook on my own Facebook or through the group uh, facebook.com forward slash the paranormal paradigm. Yeah, so do send me those stories and I'll pick a lucky winner. Um, if you don't win, you can always purchase the book from Amazon anyway, uh, Kindle or ebook. And uh, yeah, so please stay safe. Please look after yourselves. Once again, thank you very much for tuning in and allowing me to get to 
episode 20. Can't believe how fast that's gone, really. Uh, only seems like yesterday that we'd started doing this thing and I wasn't sure how long it was going to last. It was just, you know, a bit of fun and a way to to chat to like-minded people and interesting people on, subject, on subjects that I've always had an interest in. Uh, and here we are, you know, kind of 20 episodes later and we've covered some great ground and there's plenty of episodes to come, plenty of more interesting guests lined up. So stick with us and uh, enjoy the ride. So until next time, take care.